So let me just go by one by one. The first is categorization. We, I did mention that we have sparsity for D and A, but if you look at the coefficients of A, they're still very small numbers. So we went through another uh, specification through Lasso and non-negative uh, least squares to thin it down further, use cross-validation. So now you can see that the original, this particular gene, seem only appear uh, in principal pattern nine. That's the coefficient, 1.5. And this gene appear in five rooms. And this appear in four rooms of principal pattern regions, and this uh, five. So this way now you can see where are they. And this is one slide for the categorization. So how you see it? Um, the, uh, this margin is the different principal patterns. We group them according to roughly the anterior, uh, vertical, horizontal, and posterior. And here we have the genes. We didn't plot the names, but we group them according to where they mostly appear. So you see a diagonal, it's a heat map. Basically show that the, there is a core group of genes for each principal pattern that they work together. Right, this, this bunch for this, this bunch for this, right. And other people join in. So you have a core group of, core team to work on a particular pattern. Uh, on the side, we have a histogram of the proportion of genes appeared in room 21, room one, and you see this light blue block, about 20%, they are the CG genes. So for each room, we find this gene seem to be doing something, and that's new functionality uh, possibility, right? This is just from the computation. This is suggestive. So we're saying that all the gene CG genes in here seem to be building this room, and so on and so forth. And this is just uh, giving functionality to genes, which uh, basically up to now unknown what do they do. People think they're genes, but they don't know what they do. Another thing we look at is that, so each of the PP is a, a region. You can look at the centroids and measure the Euclidean distance. Well, another way to see whether what we find is, it's uh, sensible is, if two <laughs> principal pad, two rooms are close to each other, from the manager point of view, it's better for them to share many members of the team so they don't have to walk to another room to do their job. So that's what we try to see. So generally you see it's the case. So if the two PPs are close, they share more genes. So here they share like 50% of genes. And then it comes down, and then it comes back. You say, what's going on? You take one, you realize that for this particular one, this PP4 and PP17, one is the foregut, one is the hindgut. They're part of the digesting system. They're the same tissue. Therefore, they share a lot of genes. So this is more like, uh, I would say, almost like a census of genes, that type of work. It's not proof, but it's suggestive. So for hopefully for other teams, they can build on our work, and maybe they say, oh, we know this. This is what I thought. Now you have evidence. So it's kind of a service in terms of uh, um, providing analysis. Back to the prediction. Remember the second uh, bullet I said, we want to do prediction now without using the label data. Only use the features, and then the after the extract the feature. So we use the coefficients from the lasso and non-negative least squares as the feature and predict the different categories. And you can see that this is a different category to the binary classification <coughs> prediction. This is used the full image, kind of the dumb one, use the pixels. That's our method. That's the Bayesian factorization model in the literature. You can see that mostly uh, we want to be high. It's quite comparable across. So they're comparable. Right, for this, for gap, actually we do better. Okay, for the rest, sometimes we're a little worse, sometimes, you know. So overall, for the different categories, they're all comparable. But if you look at it, uh, this is uh, sparsity. How many features you use? And our answer is quite sparse, and BF is pretty sparse too. Okay, we're a little more sparse. But if you look at interpretability, right, so this is, uh, the full image, you can look at the location, we have a special way of visualize it. It's not coherent, and that's our interpretation. And the BF, the red means a negative. So you cannot really interpret a negative image. 
So that's why the Bayes factor doesn't have the positivity constraint. They might be able to improve it, but right now it's not. And in terms of speed, our method is also a lot faster because you have to run MCMC for the Bayesian factor model. So the next thing we want to do is go back to gap gene network to see that can we reconstruct uh, the gap gene network. What we do is that we use the principal patterns as a mask. You either threshold it or just use the, 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 the weight in the principal pattern as the weight in uh, Pearson correlation. So you have a local correlation only about that particular principal pattern. Principle, this is part of the gap gene network because it stripes the segmentation uh, patterns. We'll look at patterns which have significant or like major expressions through the lasso thresholding and look at pairwise correlation for that region. And then we just put them together, that's the empirical function. So you can see this as a non-parametric non-hypothesis. You assume there's no interaction. Everything's non. And then we take the 5% up and 5% down. Very simple-minded cutoff. Okay? And this is for another uh, principal pattern. And these are the two uh, thinned networks. Blue means uh, positive correlation. Red means negative correlation. And you see a lot of CG genes. That means we're possibly also giving meanings suggest meanings to these functions of these genes, which functionalities used to be unknown. So there's a lot hidden here, how they mapped it, but I can, I'm happy to send you the paper. It's a lot of details. So we were able to reproduce 11 after the 12 uh, links, okay, for this gap gene. So that was our, our first validation before we did the prediction, actually, before we did the categorization. You go back a year and a half, I was giving the talk with only this validation. And we did produce a few more links that are not here. And we, we also investigate those. It's also in the paper I won't have time to go to. So we're pretty happy. With this is years of work to come up with this. Okay, many groups and years of work in the old fashioned way. So the next is knockout. So w the biologist, this is uh, the giant when the hunchback is wild type, that's the signature, the phenotype for this early stage. That's our data. And if you make the hunchback as a mutant, then the giant change. So that's a proof they interact. Because they <laughs> so that will question. They will really, I was very pleased, they're going to do experiments based on our. Um, basically mathematical or statistical modeling. It was great, but also a lot of responsibility, right? Now you're going to stand and to do half a year work. And what if we don't give good suggestions? So the, 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 the design principle we thought about is gap genes have been repeated, uh, emphasized to us, is that the biologists think they know all the genes in the gap gene network. So if we find anything new in that gap gene network, it's a big discovery. So that's why we chose three from the gap gene network. And the CG genes is a group of genes it would be great to say we can find their functionality. So it's a combination. We took three genes from the gap gene network and two genes from the uh, Peru, uh, another well-known network, and we took four uh, CG genes. So now you have four times five, 20 experiments. But you don't know which one is upstream, which one is downstream. So you do both directions, which one you knock out. That suddenly become 40 experiments. Okay? So quickly, the number of experiments just multiply. And the lab start using, this is almost a year and a half or two years ago, when the lab started doing this experiment. So they tried out this CRISPR case, a CRISPR case 9 technology for editing genes. I think for this group, probably the only explanation. I was very impressed when I first heard about it and tried to impress my high school uh, daughter about this. And she was like, I'm learning uh, biology class. So I didn't really impress her. And then I went to talk to Sue, and she said, actually, chicken pox is like that. So you can see my biology is basically zero. Um, so uh, let me spell her name. Uh, Doutner is at Berkeley. Chapentier is in Germany. And then Zhang Fang is uh, at MIT. And there's a fight, patent fly between Berkeley and MIT who owns the CRISPR uh, case 9. 
And somebody said the best comment on that is that this person wished that the file will continue forever so everybody else could use it. So, um, so the lab tried to use it. Uh, it's a very quick and easy, relatively easy way to, to modify and edit genes. And here are some, oh, something disappeared too. Ah, interesting. Anytime you change the platform, something disappears. So this should be some image there, but I don't know where it went. So you can see this is the Y type, this is the mutant. And we think the gap, because we really think this is part of the gap gene network from our data, we think it changed the gap. But all the embryos are very different. How do you know this is just because natural variation because the embryo is different? So we went into counting cells, we're still in doing it. We have 40 experiments sitting to be analyzed, and we're now stuck because how do you know the variability is now because other things rather than the NOCA experiment? There's a lot of confounding factors. And but the lab is willing to do more experiment. We see a little difference. One way to cure it, just do a lot, lot more to, to kick up the sample size, right? Eventually we can see that on average there's a difference. So that's where we are. We have tons of data from 40 experiments. We're only looking at one. But the first, they might do more experiment, and the first try on CRISPR didn't quite work, so th th they did the second batch. So that was the waiting. That's why the paper is still uh, being finished. We haven't written about this yet. And we did try. Ben want a on this. As a result, he was quite happy. So this is RNA-seq data, and this is different tissue and different stage. You can see our principal patterns can be identified. This is male-specific. This is neuron. This is stress response. This is male-specific. So it seems to be meaningful too. That gives some indication that it's a general uh, a method for other um, high-dimensional data for decomposition. Uh, one thing I kind of didn't talk about too much is that our embryos are not, the measurements have problem, have a time stamp. It's humanly saying, oh, this is the first two hours, but in reality, it can be very different development stage that introduce error. And church group in um, Harvard last year, two uh, claiming that they could do thousands of genes simultaneously in cell. If that's the case, it's perfect for our technology because, you know, remove one source of error for us. And there's all these different animals have this type of data. We hope uh, we'll be able to use it. And um, so this is really uh, a good collaboration between biologists, computer scientists, and statisticians. And we hope we indirect contribute to human and uh, cancer research because NIH won't ever to go there. And it's really an uh, effort by a multidisciplinary and international team. And it's funded by NIH and a particular uh, center I belong to, NSF Center from Purdue, Center for Science Information. It's a bunch of actually information theory statisticians, right? I worked with them about 20 years ago. Now I'm kind of seeing them again. It's, life is a cycle, right? So I'm back with them. It's the same people I work with for information theory, the Shannon Connection, and NIH. And this is a shameless plug for my presidential address, um, the history of data science, why more for statistics and mathematics should jump in and uh, help to make a difference. Thank you. Structure with much more detail than six. Some sense, uh, sparse coding and non negative measure differentiation is the first layer of deep learning. So if you look at the output from the first layer, it's basically a ball. Yes, that's, that's what I think, I think. So we haven't tried it with deep learning, but that's what I think. If you have a shallow network, but the, the difference is that deep learning now, the way they make the biggest uh, progress is still label data. Here we didn't use. You can try to use something called autocoder. 
Uh, the thing is like this is a simpler, more straightforward, so we go for it. And for more complex problem, we, we I mean, deep learning, uh, we, we try to use it with V4 data, with neuron data. But that's definitely on our uh, radar. And I would think that we'll get very something very similar. Yeah. The homology. was aware of that paper, I was very, very excited and tried to get my post out um, uh, and Tony to read about it. But somehow, I think there's a disconnect. The ODE, really, you can simulate to see, see different patterns of the cells, right? But that's more for later stage. For this stage, we don't see much of a morphology yet. And he was working on the later stage. And I gave him the paper, and, and he couldn't. So. I like that work, but if I read later, it seems that that's, that Turing's work in particular is not somehow uh, too mainstream right now uh, because it only uh, captures one kind of communication between cells, the diffusion. My reading is that there are, seem to be other more dominant uh, modes of communication. That That's... Uh, yeah, I, I I like that. You know, I thought it was really nice, and but uh, Antoni somehow didn't. It, it's not a lot to know how to build that up. I mean, definitely the connection between statistics and biophysics type equations. I think um, with higher resolution data, I'll be more willing to go there. For this data, we did so many steps of pre-processing that it's very coarse. I feel like you, we have a gap. The, the mathematics is very, very precise for, for the ODE. And here, we're here. There's so many steps that I think whatever the signature of ODE, I feel like for, for my data, is lost. But the church data with all the things with higher resolution, I think that will be something I will be very interested in looking into. Yeah, but now, I feel like I didn't push him too far because I feel like there's not a lot of signature that captured by ODE because there's so many layers of processing. But it's something. I think very interesting, yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. <laughs>